We are speaking with Stephen Kinzer. He is an award-winning journalist and academic. Some of his books include Overthrow, America's Century of Regime Change from Hawaii to Iraq, All the Shah's Men, An American Coup and the Roots of Middle East Terror, and The Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and Their Secret World War. Today we'll be speaking about the latest addition to his canon, The True Flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the Birth of American Empire, which seems to be the thesis central to Dr. Kinzer's work over the years. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you. Now, the true flag tells us that we don't have to wonder anymore of when America went from republic to empire. It was not during the World Wars. It was the Spanish-American War of 1898. This book is timeless in that it would be relevant for those reading it a century ago and still be relevant for anyone reading it a century into the future if we get that far. Tell us about your motivation for writing the book and the genesis of American Empire. I've been writing and reading and teaching a lot about this period, the period of the Spanish-American War, 1898, 1900. So I've always been aware that it was this period when the United States made that fateful leap. We went from being what you might call a continental empire inside North America to becoming an overseas empire. That was the period when we took the Philippines and Puerto Rico and Guam and Cuba came under our control. Uh, that was a decisive moment. But I had always assumed that the United States took this step more or less automatically, that it was just the logical uh, next part of our expansion. We got to California and we kept going. Actually, this is not true. Uh, the entire United States erupted into a national debate over whether this was a good idea. It was the debate over what one senator in that period called the greatest question that has ever been presented to the American people. He was right. It was. It still is. So the question is, how should the U.S. relate to the rest of the world? Should we try to guide the world or shall we let the world guide itself and just build ourselves up as a virtuous society at home? So Every major political and intellectual figure in America took part in this debate. Uh, it was highlighted by a 32-day session of the U.S. Senate debating this great question. They, and all the senators understood that they were not just debating about the Philippines or one treaty. They were debating about the whole future of the United States in the world. So the story of this debate has more or less been lost to history. I haven't even been aware of it. The fact that there was this giant anti-imperialist league that had chapters all over the country, uh, the quality of the speeches that were made in the Senate, all of this has led me to realize that uh, back in those days, in 1898, 1899, Americans had the debate that we're not having today. So they are really debating the great question. Should the U.S. be intervening in the affairs of other countries, or is that a bad idea? We don't have that debate anymore. We assume it's a good idea. And the only debates we have are, should the next surge in Afghanistan be 4,000 troops, or should it be 6,000 troops? We're not having the larger debate over whether this whole international hegemony policy is a good idea. They did have it then. And I'm thrilled to resurrect this original debate, which is really, in the history of American foreign policy, the mother of all debate. Every argument that we have used when we debated whether to intervene in Vietnam, Central America, Iraq, Syria, was first used during this debate. And the senators were much more articulate then, I can assure you, than they are now. So you really see the debate at a high level. And I'm happy to have rescued this more or less forgotten debate from uh, historical oblivion and made it the center of my new book. And before getting into the uh, more into the empire, you mentioned how at, at that time it was this debate that took uh, place over a month with people from all walks of life. You use uh, Mark Twain and, and Teddy Roosevelt. I'd like to just ask you about Roosevelt, who's quite a character. 
Um, it seemed some of his initial accomplishments were somewhat superficial or exaggerated, such as his battle experience with the Rough Riders. How high in esteem should we regard Roosevelt in this sense, not thinking of his imperialist position? Teddy Roosevelt was a very interesting figure, as you point out, and he was complex. Historians have generally concluded that he was probably bipolar. He had, was a compulsive activist. He had uh, um, not really maybe uh, tension deficit disorder, but certainly hyperactivity was at the center of his life. Uh, so in the period that I'm covering, the period around eight, the late 1890s, Roosevelt was a fervent imperialist. He was the public face of the expansionist project. So Roosevelt had grown up as a spoiled rich kid on Long Island. He got fascinated with navies by watching boats out in Oyster Bay. He uh, had this idea that war was really the only noble pursuit for a nation or for a man. Uh, he had tremendous contempt for uh, Native peoples, whether it was Native Americans or uh, natives in any part of Asia or Africa or Latin America. Like many people in his uh, era, he believed strongly in the pyramid of races, that some races were made to rule and some races were made to be ruled. Uh, so he also created an image for himself uh, with this uh, so-called uh, charge up San Juan Hill he came across as a person who was uh, a visionary thinker about American greatness, but also a person who embodied in his own character uh, this ex aggressive, expansionist, hyper-masculine idea of what American sh sh America should be. And that idea captured uh, the spirit of that age when Americans were told just in the space of a few months in 1898 that we should go from a country that was happy and satisfied within its own borders to a country that should start to project coercive and military power around the world. That was Teddy Roosevelt's uh, great focus during this period in his career. Now, the touchy subject of a false flag comes up. In the Philippines, the U.S. deliberately seemed to have provoked a battle and pinned it on the Philippine resistance. And given that the Spanish were later acquitted of the charge of blowing the USS Maine to kingdom come, the U.S. assigning of blame on Spain as a pretext for war would by definition be considered a false flag. How do you see the role of these types of false flags in the history of empire? False flag operations, uh, that is uh, an operation that you carry out, but you try to disguise it and make it look like someone else did it, have a rich history, uh, it, not only in uh, the United States, but in the history of other imperial powers. You're absolutely right. They characterize uh, this period that I'm writing about, which was the period when America first propelled itself into the era of overseas empire. Uh, the two episodes that you mentioned uh, are uh, very important uh, foundation stones in this history. So you're right. Uh, the Americans essentially provoked uh, with what they called aggressive patrolling, uh, a skirmish in the Philippines that would allow us to uh, open up open warfare on insurgents who had been fighting against Spanish rule. So the situation there was, the United States sunk the Spanish fleet in the Philippines. So that ended Spanish colonial rule. What should we now do with the Philippines? This question occurred to Americans. Well, one logical answer would be you go to the head of the Filipino revolutionaries and shake his hand and say, well, congratulations. You're an independent country now. Good luck. You just did what Americans did a little over 100 years ago. You threw off a foreign master. So good luck to you. But we didn't want to do that. We wanted to uh, reject the insurgents' claim that they were the logical next rulers of the Philippines. We wanted to make it seem like they were making war on us as occupiers. So we cooked up a battle. And then the moment the first shot was fired, we already had a plan ready in which all the other units of the major uh, expeditionary force uh, launched offensive operations. The other uh, even bigger 
a fake news story of that era was, of course, as you mentioned, the sinking of the Maine. So this was the uh, dastardly act that drove the U.S. more than anything else into the Spanish-American War, which started all this process. Uh, the USS Maine blew up in uh, Havana Harbor in the spring of 1898. More than 200 Americans were killed. The uh, headline on William Randolph Hearst's yellow journalism rag the next day was, Sinking of the Maine was the work of an enemy. And they hammered this theme home. Within a few days, the U.S. had decided we had to go to war. Uh, in the end, it turned out that that really wasn't true. It took 75 years for the U.S. Navy to commission a, uh, an investigation into what really caused the sinking of the Maine. And it turned out that it was a spark from inside the furnace. Uh, as we unfolded our history of empire, false flag operations have been a big part of planning. In fact, um, one of the uh, more recent discoveries of this is something called Operation North Woods, in which the Kennedy administration was actively considering all sorts of pretexts to start another war with Cuba at a very high level, at the level of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The U.S. government was discussing things like launching a raid on Guantanamo Bay and making it seem like it was the Cubans that had done it, or launching terror bombings inside the United States against anti-Castro activists so we could blame it on Castro. Uh, we have brought that right up to the modern day. Every time I read about uh, gas attacks in the Middle East and I realize the sophistication uh, with which these uh, the origin of these operations can be disguised. Uh, my knowledge of false flag uh, operations in the past leads me to be a little skeptical. And uh, you cite William Sumner, who stated that war, militarism, expansion, and imperialism all favor plutocracy. And in another instance, you cite citizens who believe the republic would lose its moral bearings and begin spiraling down towards militarism and oligarchy. oligarchy. Well, here we are now with the Wall Street 1% class and the deep state military-industrial intelligence complex. This seems to be a precise formula or cycle in the history and rise and fall of empire and its end stages. What can you say about this formula and this situation today? There's no doubt that uh, the predictions that anti-imperialists made back in 1898, that I, I use as the focus of my book, have largely come true. Uh, you mentioned that quote that I used from William Graham Sumner, who's the founder of sociology, and, and, and not incidentally, by the way, the inventor of the term ethnocentrism. So he wrote that uh, the great foe of democracy during the 20th century would be plutocracy, and that since war and militarism and expansionism all favor plutocracy, they were also uh, anti-democratic forces. Well, that has definitely turned out to be true. So I start my book by reporting the first anti-imperialist meeting in American history, uh, which took place on June 15, 1898 at Faneuil Hall in Boston. And uh, one of the speeches that was delivered that day uh, warned that if the United States were to go off on an imperial policy and try to dominate other countries, uh, as the uh, clergyman put it, this will change the temper of our people and put us into a permanent attitude of arrogance, testiness, and defiance toward other nations. Well, that's just what's happened. Not only have we gotten ourselves into that position internationally, but domestically, the rise of plutocracy has been fueled by exactly the forces that Sumner cited back in his speech 120 years ago. And those are militarism and expansionism. Those are, as he pointed out, great enemies of democracy in the end because they always strengthen the plutocracy. And boy, have those predictions come through, I would say, maybe even more fully than the people who made them 120 years ago could possibly have imagined. And you describe how William Bryan goes from 
fervent anti-imperialist teaming up with Andrew Carnegie, an unlikely pair, and then completely flipping his position for personal political gain and careerism, single-handedly leading to the ratification of the Treaty of Paris that made the occupation of the Philippines possible. Later you describe how some in the anti-imperial movement were wary of immigration, that labor, labor leaders feared annexing foreign land would bring a flood of migrants. Are there not echoes and parallels of this sort of flip-flopping and immigration philosophy in President Trump's politics today? I do think that President Trump embodies uh, at least one characteristic that, that's quite common, that, that really is central to our national approach to the world, and that is indecisiveness about whether it's a good idea to be crashing into other countries or not. Now, we've never really resolved this question in our own mind. We want every country to guide itself, but we also want to guide the world. Now, you can't believe both of these things because they're opposite, but we do. Uh, we're constantly torn back and forth. We uh, are uh, subject to this missionary impulse that makes us think we have so much good to do in the world. Uh, we're compassionate people, Americans are, and we, we want to stop suffering. Our leaders know this, and whenever they want to whip us into a fervor or to attack some other country or get involved in another conflict, uh, they show us pictures of people suffering in other countries. Uh, we're actually pretty easy uh, to manipulate into war. On the other hand, uh, we do have also instincts that tell us that uh, people should be allowed to be free and make their own decisions. So we can't make up our mind. You know, we're still prisoner of this uh, consensus uh, that tells us the United States is the indispensable nation in the world. We stand taller. We see further. We know what's good for the world better than the world itself knows. Uh, this has led us into immeasurable trouble in the world and not only devastated target countries of our foreign policy, but undermined our own security. Uh, so periodically, um, politicians emerge who want to try a more restrained, a more conservative or prudent approach rather than an interventionist approach to the world. And when President Trump was running for election, he made a few comments that suggested he had sympathy for that view. But once in office, he seems to have abandoned that skepticism and has fully embraced this consensus about America's uh, role in the world and the importance of us policing the world and taking sides in regional conflicts everywhere. One thing this shows me is uh, not only that Americans are divided uh, on this question, it shows me the strength of the consensus in Washington, the force that brings political leaders to accept and embrace all these principles that have been so uh, devastating, actually, in the long run to our security, is very impressive. Most Republicans, most Democrats, most liberals, most conservatives, most think tanks in Washington, most newspaper columnists all share this basic same approach to the world that we have to be out there. If we are, if the United States is not involved in some conflict, there's going to be chaos everywhere. And when we get involved, we're always helping. We have a good impact and we can calm things down and that's good for them. And it's good for us. No matter how much counter evidence emerges, this view still has a great hold on uh, the American foreign policy establishment and lamentably uh, the advent of a so-called anti-establishment president has not changed that. And that leads into my next question. In your conclusion, you mentioned how the predictions of both sides came true to some extent, um, how, and how anti-imperialists today uh, became isolationists, and imperialists are known today as globalist uh, internationalists who promote uh, economic growth, human rights, and democracy. Um, you know, I've seen foreigners support American imperial internationalism. I guess you can call that some type of Stockholm syndrome. I don't know. Uh, I myself am, am an anti-imperialist and see that more damage than good has been done. You make the following statements, which expresses the sentiments I've had all these years. 
Americans are often described as ignorant about the world. We are, but so are most people everywhere. The difference is that most other countries' ignorance has no real effect. And I think that really hits it. We have the power to blow up the world while most of the rest of the world does not. Uh, what is your insight and ultimate position concerning uh, imperialists, globalism, internationalism versus anti-imperial isolationism? Where do you stand and where do you think the truth lies as best as we can get to it? The history of American interventions in the affairs of other countries should teach us that these interventions usually end badly. In so many cases, from Indonesia to the Congo, from Iran to Guatemala, we have intervened in ways that have taken promising situations or incipient democracies and left wreckages and tyrannies in their wake. Many of these operations have also undermined our own security. So if we would look back and analyze rationally the results of our interventions, I think we would come to the conclusion that they don't serve the cause of global stability, and they don't serve the cause of promoting American security either. So a country the size of the United States that has the history and the wealth of the United States is certainly going to be intervening in the world inevitably in some way. And I don't protest that because there would be no point in that. And it probably it would be, it's, it's not a bad idea in itself. But let's think carefully about how to intervene, where to intervene, with what tools to intervene. When you violently crash into the affairs of another country, you're doing something like releasing a wheel at the top of the hill. You can let it go. But you have no control over how it's going to bounce or where it's going to end up. These operations always have tremendous unintended consequences. The Iraq war, just, just one recent example, we're still paying a price for that intervention that's mind-boggling. You, you can't even conceive of everything that that has cost the world. And that was a war we didn't have to fight. So my recommendation is that the United States now take a more prudent and restrained approach to the world. We have plenty of problems at home. Our record in the world is not so sterling. Let's try to uh, pull back a little bit. Let other countries in the world and other regions of the world resolve their own disputes and abandon the fantasy that we need to dictate to the world how it should resolve all its problems. You end your book with the statement that it's it's late, but not too late. Bernie Sanders, I believe, recently cited your Boston Globe op-ed on Saudi Arabia. What is your outlook for the various flashpoints we've jumped into, our attack on Russia that can go nuclear, Saudi Arabia, and our remaking of the Middle East that promotes Wahhabism, our attempt to control Europe through the EU-NATO mechanism and CIA meddling in European elections, where do you see, basically, Empire America going from here on out? It's uh, distressing to me most recently to see the extent to which the United States has thought to put its thumb on the scale in Middle East conflict. So I'm a great believer that uh, our embrace of Saudi Arabia is excessive and that our demonization of Iran is excessive. Uh, I think we ought to be treating them a little more evenly and not consider that one is the font of evil and the other is our best friend. Uh, they are having a proxy dispute. Different countries in that region are switching from one side or being pressured from the other side. That's the kind of thing that happens in parts of the world. It's not so unusual in geopolitics. The United States doesn't have to be involved in that. Saudi Arabia winds up the dominant force in Qatar. Iran winds up the dominant force in Qatar. It's not so crucial to us. Let the countries in the region work out their own balances of power. The United States doesn't have to crash in there. When we do, we risk, as is exactly happening now in the Persian Gulf, inflaming a situation, which is not what the United States is supposed to be using its power to do. So here's an example of a place where I think uh, prudent restraint would have uh, led us to say, uh, 
countries in the Middle East have disputes to sort out and uh, good luck to them, rather than to say, we've decided. So everything Saudi Arabia says is good. Go off and uh, let Saudi Arabia uh, be as a king of that part of the world. Only within two weeks later, not only do they intensify their war in Yemen, but they start making threats against another country in their region, Qatar. And now regional blocks are emerging. So I understand that these kinds of things are going to happen in the world, but I, I wish the United States would not feel the need to jump into every one of these disputes. Let's realize that we don't have a magic formula for resolving them. And in fact, history suggests that uh, our formula only makes things worse in many cases. So before I could begin to dream that the United States would begin to project policies into the world that would promote stability and dialogue, I'd first like to take the initial step of getting to the point where we don't take steps that actively promote instability and uh, the, raise the possibility of intensified wars in a part of the world that we're trying to pacify. And I just wanted to get your quick thought or comment on Vladimir Putin and this quote that recently came out from him that says, I believe that if you think you are the only world power trying to impose on the whole nation the idea of their exclusiveness, this creates an imperialistic mentality in society which in turn requires an adequate foreign policy expected by society and the country's leaders are forced to follow this logic and in practice this might go contrary to the interest of the Americans. It demonstrates it's impossible to control everything. Our demonization of Russia, especially in the last few years and the last few months, is way over the top. And we have made Putin into something like the arch villain of the world. Uh, in fact, if you look at the world from Russia's perspective, you, you can understand exactly the point that Putin was making. The United States is working relentlessly to encircle Russia uh, with military bases, and we've been quite successful in doing that. Uh, we are aggressively pushing our military power right onto Russia's borders. We're having military maneuvers right on within sight of Russia's borders. Imagine if the Russian army were to have maneuvers in Tijuana, in Mexico, right on our border, the Mexican government might say, well, we have an alliance, we have a treaty, we've made a friendship treaty, uh, we're an independent country. We should allow military maneuvers, and uh, we're going to let the Russians build a base here in Tijuana. The United States would never allow this. Uh, we wouldn't have an enemy practicing war games on our border. We would not allow the Chinese to open up a base in Quebec, even though uh, legally that's the right of the Canadians. But yet we expect the Russians to think nothing of the fact that we're practicing our war games right within sight of the Russian border. And we've installed nuclear weapons all around their borders. So uh, the idea that uh, Russia, which is actually a, a weak and economically and uh, sociologically struggling country, is a real major threat to the United States, is, I think, a, a wild exaggeration. In fact, the greater threat that could come from Russia would be the collapse of central power. Then we'd have the time when we'd wish for Putin back. If you wind up with Russia in chaos, and 25 Chechnyas around the country, we might think a little differently about the value of central power in Russia. So I think uh, we sometimes see situations in the world that we consider unsatisfactory, so we want to get rid of them, but we don't stop to think about what's going to come next. This is the essential problem that we're facing in Iraq. It was fine to say that Saddam Hussein was a bad leader and he should be overthrown, but what's coming after that? Uh, somehow in the American fantasy, we have this view that we're so powerful, we can create any kind of new system that we want right afterward. That doesn't always happen. So I would love to see us uh, calm down the rhetoric on Russia and realize that uh, if we have to take a look, a look around the world at real threats to our security, Russia is not one of them. We have built up Russia. Uh, maybe because Russia is so a convenient an ally, because an enemy, because we're used to thinking of Moscow as 
the source of hostility. But uh, it's a great example of how the press jumps onto a government narrative, magnifies it a hundred times, and has a real effect on America's approach to the world. That's another modern repeat of the syndromes that I talk about in my book that happened over a century ago. Okay. Any final comments or thoughts from you? I just want the consensus to begin to emerge out there somewhere in the United States that uh, there's a better way for the U.S. to approach the world than uh, trying to dominate it. All right. That'll do it. I greatly encourage listeners to go out now and purchase the true flag on Kindle or paperback and pick up some of uh, the previous works, such as The Brothers and Their Secret World War. Understanding this historical context will help you understand precisely what is happening today. Forget the daily news cycle. Uh, you can follow Stephen Kinzer's work at stephenkinzer.com. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Kinzer. Forget the daily news cycle. I love it.